Let's get into it. What a week. On Monday, Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman, the leading Democratic candidate, revealed he suffered a stroke but reassured voters that he was headed toward a full recovery. We wouldn't worry. He's under the medical care of a top-notch team of doctors headed by one named, hold on, I've got the name right here, Dr. Oz. Oh, no. <laughs> Imagine you're John Fetterman, beep, 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 beep. You open your eyes and you see that fucking Botoxed face coming at you. The pillow down. <laughs> and despite his brain's failed effort to derail his candidacy, Fetterman won Pennsylvania's Democratic Senate primary on Tuesday. The results are in. Voters want the largest Democrat we can find. <laughs> Stop asking policy questions. Start asking how many buckets of cod they eat per day. Meanwhile, Pennsylvania Republicans chose State Senator Doug Mastriano, a literal insurrectionist who was at the Capitol on January 6th as their gubernatorial candidate. Here's what he said about what he'd do as governor. This is a quote. I get to appoint the Secretary of State who's delegated from me the power to make the corrections to elections, the voting logs and everything. I could decertify every machine in the state with the stroke of a pen via the Secretary of State. I already have the Secretary of State picked out and I've was surprised to learn it, it is gritty. <laughs> We've lost gritty. <laughs> gritty would not go along with this. Not our gritty. Anyway, this guy's a full-blown authoritarian and you can read all about it in the New York Times in a story probably headlined, for Pennsylvania Republicans, a firebrand and a reckoning. <laughs> anyway, the stakes are total. So once again, I'm asking everyone listening, go to votesaveamerica.com and sign up for Midterm Madness. You can join me in the eastern region that runs from Pennsylvania right here to Maine, from school board races to governor's races. We have to fight for choice, for democracy, for all of it. You can also volunteer with the Maine Democrats who are doing a month of action right now. If you want to be part of Vote Save America, go to votesaveamerica.com. I'm sorry to get so serious. I'm gonna need a drink after this. I'm gonna have a baby Russian. That's a white Russian made with baby formula. <laughs> In other news, Idaho Lieutenant Governor Janice McGeehan, who famously attempted several power grabs when incumbent Governor Brad Little left the state for even a few days, lost the Republican primary. Still, she had to share her simple vision for Idaho. God calls us to pick up the sword and fight, and Christ will reign in the state of Idaho. She sounds like a wizard who's been transported through time to prevent a governor from taking a vacation. <laughs> Madison Cawthorn lost his seat in Congress on Tuesday. to State Senator Chuck Edwards in the Republican primary. North Carolina to Madison Cawthorn, we wouldn't. <laughs> Outside of his career in politics, the 61-year-old Edwards is a McDonald's franchise owner. Glad to see the district is sticking with its a little something for love it policy. <laughs> <laughs> in his first Instagram post since losing his primary, Madison Cawthorn long-windedly vowed vengeance against the cowardly and weak members of his own party, writing, it's time for the rise of a new right. It's time for dark MAGA to truly take command. <laughs> Enough of this light, cheerful MAGA. <laughs> dark MAGA is just like the regular MAGA, except you need a VPN, and Don Jr. will sell you coke there. Cawthorn writes that he's now on a mission to expose those who say and promise one thing, yet legislate and work towards another self-profiteering globalist goal. Buddy, you're working too hard. Just tell us who's at the orgies. <laughs> anyway, I never really got the appeal of Mackenzie Cawthorn or whatever his name is. <laughs> I'm more into like 60-year-old McDonald's franchise owners who look like Frank Zabotka from The Wire. I don't know. It just does something for me. Speaking of McDonald's, they're leaving Russia entirely, announcing that the continued ownership of the business in Russia is no longer tenable, nor is it consistent with McDonald's values. Grimace, long suspected of being an FSB sleeper agent, will stay behind. 
Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas described the leak of the Alito Roe versus Wade opinion as a historical breach of trust. When you lose that trust, especially in, in the institution that I'm in, it changes the institution fundamentally, he told a conservative conference. You begin to look over your shoulder. It's like kind of an infidelity that you can explain it, but you can't undo it, continued Thomas. And it's like, even though you've apologized and bought the court flowers, you can tell that something's off. The court says it forgives you, but keeps going to bed early. And one time you heard it crying in the bathroom, and you're like, what else does the court expect me to do here? <laughs> Justice Thomas, whose wife Ginny Thomas, worked fervently to undermine the 2020 election, also praised conservatives for never stooping to the lows liberals have, such as protesting outside of justices' houses. You would never visit Supreme Court justices' houses when things didn't go our way, he declared. We didn't throw temper tantrums. I think it's incumbent on us to always act appropriately and not repay tit for tat. Ginny Thomas was in the audience, nodding vociferously, while holding a noose labeled, insert Pelosi here. President Biden announced that the FDA will allow baby formula to be imported from outside the U.S. to increase supply. Finally, uh, it's been really hard to get baby formula, which is annoying because it is great in cereal. <laughs> I only have four cases left. I'll tell you something people don't like. When you're at the store and you ask if the baby formula comes with a straw. <laughs> I know it's a serious issue. In a contentious hearing, filled with right-wing misinformation, area goon Thomas Massey said this. Those who would prematurely end the life of their baby are being called patients. Uh, you know, and my body, my choice. I remember when I was young and before I learned, you know, how babies came about, I thought when they said my, ba my body, my choice, they were talking about, you know, whatever was inside of the woman was part of their body. The baby is not the body of the woman that it's inside of. The baby is the body and the woman is the coat that the baby is wearing. What do you coats not understand about that? <laughs> it's tough out there, people. George W. Bush had one of the most revealing slips in American history when this happened. The result is an absence of checks and balances in Russia and the decision of one man to launch a wholly unjustified and brutal invasion of Iraq. I mean, of Ukraine. <laughs> Iraq, anyway. Uh, 75. Uh, First of all, like as a way of explaining saying he's 75, <laughs> a lot of people think 75 is when your memory starts to go, but for George W. Bush, he's, he's here to tell you that then that's when you start recalling your worst choices with like haunting clarity. <laughs> uh, this clip is like, I don't know, it, 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 it makes, it gives you such a weird, Remember how bad that was? In a wholly different way. It was bad. It was so, so bad. In another different way. Every day, it was terrible. You just see that guy, and you're like, God, I forgot how much I fucking hated you. <laughs> I, it's... It, And just seeing, and just like the, the, the whole audience laughs, and it's like, what are we laughing at here, people? What are we laughing at? It brought the energy down. <laughs> a former Louisiana National Guard officer was allowed to retire after he received a general court martial convicting him of motorboating a subordinate <laughs> during an informal, an informal promotion ceremony while they were deployed to Jordan in May of 2021. Yeah, it sounds pretty informal. <laughs> also, motorboating, really? That's a job for the Coast Guard. 
Don't applaud that. White mom Melissa Riley went on Fox News to claim that her biracial son has changed and is refusing to do chores after taking part in critical anti-racism curricula in his school. So when you're saying he gets a bad grade at school, he blames racism, or a girl rejects him on a date, racism, are those the kind of things you're seeing? Yes, I ask him to clean the house, racism, yes. <laughs> you're kidding, right? Are you serious? <laughs> No, I'm serious. They have totally changed his perspective. They have put him in a box. This is so heartbreaking. Critical race theory made her son hilarious. <laughs> During this week's Senate hearing about UFOs, Deputy Director of Naval Intelligence Steve Bray played a video of a shiny sphere zipping past a naval jet, admitting, I do not have an explanation for what this specific object is. These flying objects could be truly anything, even and I don't mean to be fringe here, lens flares that obscure ordinary objects like planes and weather balloons and then appear to move only because the gimbal that allows the camera to maintain a lock on the obscured object. <laughs> nah, it's aliens. It's aliens. Don't worry, it's aliens. It's aliens. At one point during the hearing, DOD's Undersecretary of Intelligence, Ronald Moultrie, said, I enjoy the challenge of what may be out there. I have followed science fiction. I have gone to conventions even. I'll say it on the record, but there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Moultrie continued, I've dabbled in cosplay. I own a lightsaber. There's no shame in this. I've been thrown out of Comic-Con for trying to steal a lock of William Shatner's hair. I've been called too intense while LARPing. I'm like everyone else, and I've kissed a woman. <laughs> Meanwhile, Neil Patrick Harris apologized for a 2011 Halloween charcuterie board <laughs> shaped like the corpse of Amy Winehouse. <laughs> yeah, he's had a tough week. <laughs> yes, he had to apologize for a charcuterie board in the shape of Amy Winehouse, a photo of which resurfaced recently on Twitter. Look, every gay man dreads the day he'll have to publicly apologize for a charcuterie board. <laughs> When I saw the image, I was like, too soon. A proper prosciutto de Parma needs to be aged for at least three years. <laughs> that joke should have ended with a, isn't that right, Frasier? <laughs> that is the most Frasier joke we've ever done. That is in a time machine to the cutting room floor of, 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 of peak 1998 Frasier. And finally, while fleeing a traffic stop, a Florida woman crashed into multiple cars and threw a fake snake at deputies trying to arrest her. <laughs> deputies were assaulted by the fake snake while attempting to avail themselves to some of the suspects' canned peanut brittle. <laughs> this week on The Wheel, we have the CDC's mind games, the smell of an airport Wendy's, bling empire, lobsters are too expensive because they are bugs, Adults earnestly wearing Crocs, The Sims, Imperfect Victims, and Conversations with Friends. Let's spin the wheel. It has landed on Imperfect Victims, and I put this here because I'm a bit troubled by the uh, Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard television shenanigans. And, and I will say this because I ignored it. I ignored it for a long time. And I sorted it, I think, the way the, it is intended by how it's portrayed to be sorted as some nonsense going on on television. Which, of course, there is. There is nonsense involved in what we are seeing unfold on television. Uh, but there was something about the way it was being treated as something purely funny and people making fun of Amber Heard and then you dig into it a little bit and you're like, oh, oh, we're doing that thing again. We're doing the exact same thing. There's a moment when the recent history just becomes history and we're kind of doing that with the 90s. We're, we're, like, we're doing it with shows like the Golden Girls. We're doing it with the, the OJ trial and we're doing it with the Lewinsky scandal where we say, wait a second, that didn't take place during our time. It took place in a previous era and that gives us the kind of cultural space to look at what we got right and what we got wrong and we realize like, oh, we maligned and villainized these women based on 
just pure, unadulterated misogyny. That's what happened to Monica Lewinsky. Uh, that's what happened to uh, Marsha Clark. That's what happened in the 90s. And it is shocking to see us do it again. That's what also happened to Mia Farrow, by the way. And, and it's really, when I started digging in a little, I realized, oh, what Johnny Depp is trying to do worked on me because I just dismissed it all as nonsense. But really what, what it is is Amber Heard is an imperfect victim, but there's no such thing as a perfect victim. Uh, that's it. And the success, and, by, and just one other thing, the success of this idea that she, the idea that like one of the most salient facts is that someone was supposedly pooping in a bed, which very well may not be true at all, completely manufactured, but has become an acceptable, accepted part of the story is the way in which someone like Johnny Depp using his power and resources creates enough chaos and noise and confusion to get people who aren't paying close attention and living their lives to dismiss the whole thing out of hand. So we should probably not do that. Uh, that's all I wanted to say about that. Let's spin the wheel. It has landed on The Sims. So my name is John Hodgman, and nostalgia is a toxic impulse. Uh, the past was not as great as we think it was, and we can't go back anyway. And any political movement that is founded on those two fallacies is a monstrous lie. However, I have really been enjoying playing SimCity 2013 lately. <laughs> It's the last version of SimCity to come out. Uh, wildly buggy, controversial, a lot of fun. I'm not playing it to go back in time to 2013 because when I played it back then, it just aggravated me. Because in SimCity, you know, it's a city simulation. You build a little city and then you have all these helpers, uh, these virtual helpers who are helping you build the city, but they're really just yellers. And they just yell at you and they say, you're doing it wrong. You're not zoning enough residential. There's a worker shortage. Uh, there's unemployment. There's a guy in a hard hat yelling at me, which is my worst nightmare. <laughs> Used to make me very anxious. Now I come back to it, it's actually very therapeutic. Because for once, I figured out it was a game. <laughs> and second, I got better at it. So when Johnny Hardhat yells at me, uh, there's an unemployment crisis, I just knock down a few factories. All of a sudden, we have full employment. It's great. <laughs> Worker shortage, no problem. I'm gonna build uh, high-speed rail, bring in workers from the rest of the region. It's fantastic, it's terrific. It's very, it's, it's an anxiety reduction tool. And I, I, it's, like, it's, like watching, it's like Bob Ross doing magic of oil painting. I'm just making happy little cities, happy little trees, happy little roads, but there's a problem, which is these goddamn Sims. These are the little fake humans who live in my city by the hundreds of thousands. And, and Jonathan, they're dumb. They're, they're dumb, they're whiny, and they're very annoying. They cannot drive to work the right way. They're always taking circuitous routes to make traffic jams. And then when I try to build public transport for them, they get mad. I built them a sweet maglev train that reduces their land value and now they're mad at me. But if I tear down a public library and put up a casino, they're happy. They're terrible. All they want is more shopping, and all they want is more services for lower taxes. They're horrible non-humans. I dislike them. Yeah, they, they definitely sound so different from people I know. who are furious when you tear down a library and put up a casino. Right. <laughs> but here's the thing. I'm trying to create my perfect world. Right, sure. I don't need these, li these little creatures yelling at me all the time, yeah. popping up with their complaint balloons. <laughs> no, I can't find a park. It's like, it's across the street. I made it for you. <laughs> There's a flower plaza across the street. Me yelling at my computer to these tiny, and they're small, Jonathan. They're small, <laughs> small in stature, small of heart, small of mind. It gets to the point where I get mad at them, right? And when they say, oh, I can't find a park, I was like, I smashed down their house and I put a park where their house used to be. <laughs> and then when I do that, all of their neighbors are really happy. They're monsters to each other. I don't care for them. But then I realized, like, ooh, I'm looking at this from 10,000 feet up. I'm looking at the grid, the whole thing. 
They're tiny. I'm big. I'm powerful. I'm destroying their houses. I get so mad that I just wipe out a whole city block and put in an, an oil drill or a coal mine. I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm destroying the ozone. I'm destroying the globe in my own planet. That's not who I am. And I realize this is what happens when you become divorced from what people want. When you start to think of them as just little things that don't matter. When you have power, like I do in SimCity, you start to think of people <laughs> as, as things that don't matter, as things you can just wipe away. And so it's, it, it helps me understand how power is. Like So for example, say you're a United States senator and you've publicly said that you're in favor of Roe versus Wade and abortion rights. But when it comes time to defend those things, you don't do it because you want to hold on to power and political capital. Right? And then, and then when these tiny little non-human sims come to your house and, and sidewalk chalk a little complaint outside your door, You call the police on them. You wipe them, you call the police on them. And by also, the Sims in SimCity 2013, they love the police, it's terrible. <laughs> the constant, like, can we fund the police more? I'm like, whoa, what the, no, forget about it. Then I just wipe them all out. <laughs> we have to be careful about, I mean, this, I think it helps, like SimCity helped me understand this, the, the problem of power, that you stop seeing humans as humans. And you start seeing them as widgets who should be working for you. And when they complain, your skin's so thin, you're a senator. You take it that personally that you call the police on sidewalk chalk? It's ridiculous. So that's what I'm learning from it. And if you want to follow along, check me out Monday mornings, 9 a.m., twitch.tv slash John Hodgman. Hell yeah. It's called The Joy of Zoning, a SimCity stream. It's uh, fascinating. Basically, you, uh, you go in, you either, uh, uh, you, 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 you go in as John Hodgman, but in time you become Robert Moses. That's what happens. That's exactly right. That's basically where in you end time, up. In time we all become that which we loathe. And I become Robert Moses in this world. I'm, <laughs> I'm the destroyer of sim worlds. <laughs> <laughs> Let's spin it again. It has landed on Bling Empire, which I believe was suggested by Chanda. I don't even know where to begin with this show. Okay, maybe I'm just about to ruin the season for you or save you about eight hours. I don't remember exactly how many hours I put into it. I'm just going to say I am such an avid reality TV show watcher that I watched Naked and Afraid of Love. Like, I watched the Love <laughs> Island version of Naked and Afraid. <laughs> And this season of Bling Empire was worse than that was. And what is it? <laughs> it's a Wait, show. Wait, I have to explain what Bling Empire is to people? What is it? Is it on, what channel is it on? All right, folks. The basis of the show is, it's basically like a real housewives style show, but it focuses on people who are Asian American and of Asian descent in the Los Angeles area. Netflix fired like a lot of fucking people over the last like two weeks, and they should have fired the producers of this show. Yeah. <laughs> this season, they have a storyline that is clearly extraordinarily contrived. Not and on a reality show. No, look, look, it's so extraordinarily contrived that it makes The Bachelor look really sincere. <laughs> like, as a woman of color, who watches reality television, I, I feel like representation on reality television is kind of a double-edged sword, right? On the one hand, reality television is terrible, none of us should be watching it, I'm embarrassed to be confessing that I spend a lot of time watching it, and on the other hand, we actually do spend a lot of time watching it, right? And so it becomes important that we see people who reflect the communities that we come from, the communities that we know that we're a part of. I'm, I'm part of a, an Asian American household, and so this kind of representation is important, which is why it's so important that we actually get good storylines on these shows. And so we have to get a good storyline. So I just, I want Bling Empire to do better. I want Netflix to do better. I Come want on, Netflix. Netflix. Get main watching Bling Empire. Let's That's get main watching Bling Empire. You guys have power here at night? <laughs> how, how late can you watch TV here? 
Let's spin it one more time. It has landed on lobsters are too expensive, they're bugs. I will also touch upon CDC mind games. Let's put them together. There are two things that have been bothering me while I've been here in Portland, Maine. One is the price of lobster. The second is the fact that the second that is, I, here's my, okay. I have three things that have been bugging me. One, the price of lobster. Two, the fact that we are in year three of this pandemic and every time it comes uh, uh, down to a debate inside these agencies as to whether or not to improve vaccines, push for vaccines, whatever, the conversation goes something like this. And this is something Zainab Tufechi, who's a very smart uh, 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 expert, has been talking about for years and kind of uh, uh, ringing the alarm about. So the New York Times covered this question about what kind of a uh, campaign they should run around vaccines in the fall. Uh, this is what uh, a senior investigator uh, who heads the CDC's vaccine working group said. Considering additional doses for a smaller and smaller return is creating an impression that we don't have a very effective vaccination program. Stop trying to outsmart people. Just make the best vaccine you can and get it to as many people as you can. We are on year three of this. They are dawdling on approvals. Uh, one thing Zainet pointed out, which is absolutely true, they are about to approve a third dose for a kid that is 61 months old, while an immunocompromised kid that's 59 months old cannot get a single dose, even off-label with a ped pediatrician recommendation. Maybe the problem is not the impression that is possibly being created by scientists pretending to be pundits. Maybe the problem has been the lackadaisical, slow, and confusing way in which they have been approving vaccinations for the past two years. And I, I understand that this was a, obviously this is a once in a century pandemic. These are brilliant, smart, caring experts doing their best in a complicated media environment, trying to figure out how to help the most people. But I just think at this point, uh, to quote, I think one of the smartest people around, which is Alfred uh, from the film Dark Knight Rises, when he said, stop trying to outsmart the truth, let the truth have its day. Just tell people that you think it helps. One other fact, the number of Americans who have opted to get a booster dose has dwindled with each new recommended shot. While 90% of American adults have received at least one dose of a COVID vaccine, 76% opted for a second dose and just 50% for a third. I do not think that it was a result of people, find, people believing based on the approvals that the vaccines are ineffective. I think that is because the messaging has been consistently confusing, especially because it was clear starting in the summer of last year that we were going to need boosters, but a lot of people, including a lot of coverage in the New York Times, which has not been great on this, uh, said that we might not need boosters, that it was wrong to get boosters, that it was depriving boosters from other people, and it was confusing. And by the time they approved it around Thanksgiving, you had people waiting around the block to get boosters instead of what should have been happening, which is getting people boosters uh, starting in the summer so that we went into last winter with as many people protected as possible. We are in the middle of uh, uh, rising cases right now. I don't understand how we're having the same debate over and over again. I also think it is crazy that lobsters are just fucking bugs. <laughs> They're just bugs. And it's time we face it. And I don't know what the rules are about lobsters, but I remember from my studies that there was a time when lobsters were for prisons and they were the size of a table. Where are they? What happened? Are, are, are we throw, what, are, what happened to the giant ones? They went to space, Jonathan. They went to space. Did they go to space? I'll tell you what, I heard, I heard you talking about aliens before, but they are out there. They're very often here. They are lobsters. That's what they are. Alien space bugs colonized this planet 24 years ago. It's so recent. Very recently. Really they recent. They created a false memory that there had always been lobsters here. And now they've seen enough and they're leaving. <gasps> Especially the big ones. Especially the big ones, they're the oldest. But I'll tell you what, they're leaving those crabs behind. <laughs> those goddamn crabs. <laughs> Complainers, all of them. And then we in Maine and New Hampshire built our economies on them in the last uh, 20... Well, Maine did. I don't know about New Hampshire. <laughs> New Hampshire Shout just... out to our New Hampshire lobster fishermen. I will close my rant 
about various different topics by saying this. I have been in Portland, Maine for 27 hours. I have had three meals. They were all lobster rolls. <laughs> and I will not tell you where I got them from because there was a time in this world when you showed up in a new city and people were excited to see what you tried. No longer. Now you show up a city and people want to know whether or not you failed. <laughs> whether or not you got the right lobster roll. Whether or not you did the right amount of research. And I will not go down that road with you because I think we've had too much fun. That is the rant wheel. Believe it.